six weeks into the war. Near the town of Staria Rusa, German soldiers pondered a strange contraption captured in recent fighting. It was an artillery system, but not like anything of their own. Each truck carried a crude-looking frame onto which rockets were loaded. The Soviet counterattack here had been supported by dozens of these rocket launchers. It had helped to stall the advance of the entire German Army Group North, striking towards Leningrad. They had bought time, time that would prove crucial. The BM-13 multiple rocket launch system, given the girl's name Katyusha by the troops, was a rail launch rack on a truck chassis. Gears elevated and rotated the launcher rack into the correct firing position, as determined by an artillery sight. The rockets were very inaccurate and would rain down over a wide area, but the Katyusha made up for this with a fearsome rate of fire. One Katyusha could launch 16 rockets in less than 10 seconds. Firing en masse, they could devastate a massive area in the blink of an eye. Leningrad, Russia's Baltic seaport, was a key objective of the German invasion. From here, Soviet submarines and the Baltic fleet threatened Germany's supply of iron ore, which came by sea from neutral Sweden. The plans for the German invasion stated that the assault on Moscow could proceed only after Leningrad and its naval base at Kronstadt had been captured. Hitler, with growing confidence in his own military genius, was increasingly involved in strategic planning. He was now determined that, if necessary, the armoured forces assaulting Moscow should be diverted to Leningrad. Army Group North, advancing on Leningrad, had been stopped at the so-called Luger Line in July. This 175-kilometer line of fortifications had been hastily built by soldiers of the reserve and citizens of Leningrad. In August, Army Group North was reinforced with tanks and dive bombers from Army Group Center. They crashed through the Luger line and encircled the troops defending it. The Red Army fed its new KV heavy tanks into the battle. They were produced in Leningrad itself at the Kirov factory. The front armour of a KV-1 was 75mm thick. The German 37mm anti-tank gun barely made a scratch. But early in the war, fuel shortages and poorly trained crews who didn't know how to repair their vehicle meant many KV-1s and other Soviet vehicles ended up abandoned at the roadside. On the 19th of August, a company of KVs commanded by senior Lieutenant Kolobanov took up an ambush position near the town of Krasnogvardis. Kolobanov picked the position himself, overlooking the highway as it wove through the marshes. When a column of German tanks appeared, his tanks took out the lead and rear vehicles and proceeded to destroy all 22 enemy machines. After the battle, Kolobanov's crews counted 156 marks where German shells had hit their tanks but failed to penetrate. After hearing reports about the KV tanks, Hitler once more demanded the capture of Leningrad and its factory that was churning out these monsters. 
but there weren't enough KV-1s to stop the Germans everywhere. While one German corps was held at Krasnogvardisk, others broke through near Lyuban and Tosna. On the 30th of August, the Germans cut the railway and the highway connecting Leningrad with the rest of the country. Finnish troops, allies of the Germans, approached from the north. The city's electricity supply began to fail, but still no civilians were evacuated, an act which might appear defeatist. On the 8th of September, the Germans captured Schlieselberg on the shore of Lake Ladoga, the final act of encirclement. It was the beginning of a siege that was to last 882 days. When the siege began, the city's population was more than 2.5 million, including approximately 400,000 children. The city contained 300,000 refugees from the Baltic republics and surrounding area. The city's supplies of food and fuel were sufficient for just 30 days. Soviet counterattacks aimed at lifting the siege were all unsuccessful. The German encirclement near Schlieselberg was only about 12 kilometers wide. This sector was the focus of Soviet attempts to lift the blockade. That summer, Soviet counterattacks had robbed Army Group North of valuable weeks. It was time that could not be got back. Now the attack on Moscow would rob Army Group North of its best units. In his diary, the commander of Army Group North, Field Marshal von Lieb, wrote, 11th of September, desperate shortage of time. The Army High Command demands seven mobile divisions be handed over to its control on the 15th of September. His tanks were on their way towards Moscow. It was a desperately needed respite for Leningrad. The same day, General Zhukov was appointed commander of the Leningrad Front. His deputy, Major General Fedyaninsky came with him. Ivan Ivanovich Fedyaninsky spent most of his military career in the Russian Far East. In 1939, he was made a hero of the Soviet Union for his bravery fighting the Japanese at the Battle of Kalkin Gol. In 1941, he commanded a Soviet rifle corps in Belorussia, where he was badly wounded. Zhukov's appointment immediately inspired the defenders of the city. There was new confidence that Leningrad would be saved. With characteristic energy, Zhukov began to organize the city's defenses. Artillery was to be the key, and his secret weapon will be the massive guns of the Red Banner Baltic Fleet. Powerful naval gunnery halted the first German offensive just seven kilometers from the city. The 12-inch guns of the coastal fort of Krasnoya Gorka also served to hold the German army at bay. The shock waves from their exploding shells were powerful enough to hurl German tanks into the air. But where the German army had failed, the Luftwaffe might still succeed. Three months into the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Army Group North was held up outside Leningrad by the heavy guns of the Soviet Baltic Fleet. So Field Marshal von Lieb turned to his dive bombers to sink the enemy warships. Their first victim was the old battleship Mara. Two 1,000-kilogram bombs struck her bow, causing her forward turret magazine to explode. 
she quickly sank to the bottom of the bay. Three warships were sunk in total, depriving the city's defences of 35 powerful guns. Around the city, 1,500 loudspeakers broadcast Leningrad city radio. Now it was also used to issue air raid warnings. When there were no radio programmes, a metronome was put on the air. Slow ticking meant all clear. Fast ticking meant take cover. It became known as the beating heart of Leningrad. Above the city, German bombers were met with heavy anti-aircraft fire. But the Luftwaffe only made a few large-scale raids. Shelling by German heavy artillery proved much more lethal. Signs went up on street corners with the warning, citizens, this side of the street is more dangerous during shelling. The Germans didn't target Leningrad's tallest buildings or church spires. They were needed as reference points by the artillery spotters, who instead guided shells onto the city's bridges, houses and shops. Leningrad was truly a city on the front line. Monuments were protected by sandbags and wooden screens, but many would not survive German bombardments. On the city's outskirts, the Germans captured the Catherine Palace and the Grand Petergoff Palace. Both were looted and destroyed. The world-famous Amber Room was shipped to Germany. Today, its whereabouts remain a mystery. On the 8th of September, German bombers targeted the wooden Badayev warehouses, where the city's food reserves were stored. The glow of the fires could be seen across the city. Soon everyone knew that the flour and sugar supplies had been destroyed. But the situation was even worse than many feared. The city needed a 1,000 tonnes of food every day to prevent starvation, but less than 200 tonnes were getting through the blockade. The little that could be brought in by air was nowhere near enough to feed the city's population. The main supply route into Leningrad now lay across Lake Ladoga, 50 kilometres of open water. But the lake was notorious for its strong winds and sudden storms. It was why, in 1718, Peter the Great had ordered the construction of the Ladoga Canal along the lake's southern shore to provide a safe waterway to the city. But the Germans had reached the southern shore of Lake Ladoga, cutting the canal and rail links into the city. The people of Leningrad had to build a new port from scratch on the lake's western shore. In the first week of the siege, barges were unloaded straight onto the beach. It was the beginning of a supply route that would come to be known as the Road of Life. Food rationing had been introduced at the start of the war. Leningrad workers received 800 grams of bread a day. Their dependents received 400 grams. By the beginning of October, it had been reduced to half that amount. It wasn't nearly enough to sustain those required to do physical work. At the end of November, the city was on the brink of starvation. Bread rations were cut further, 250 grams for a worker, 125 grams for everyone else. The quality of the bread was falling too, as the authorities turned to unlikely ingredients to increase its bulk. Bakers used burnt flour recovered from the ruins of the Badayev warehouses. They used oats intended for the horses, soya, barley, and even cellulose from the Goznak paper mill. People often had to queue for hours in the freezing cold to receive these meager rations. In November, 11,000 died from starvation, 350 each day. The medical staff could only look on helplessly. 
The early winter led to hopes that Lake Ladoga would quickly freeze solid, allowing trucks to bring in supplies across its frozen surface. But the ice took time to harden. The Soviets had hoped to establish a road bridge across the ice using the shortest route. But this would put convoys within range of the German artillery batteries on the southern shore. Slowly, the ice thickened. On the 20th of November, across 180 millimetres of ice, the first horse-drawn sleighs crossed the lake. Two days later, the first trucks crossed. It was a perilous crossing. The two-ton vehicles carried much less than their full load. But several still crashed through the ice, disappearing into the frozen depths. Drivers stood on their running boards, ready to leap clear if the ice began to crack. On their return journey, the same trucks were used to evacuate as many civilians as possible. The road of life was 30 kilometers long. It included garages, rest stops and field hospitals. There were several alternative routes, depending on the ice and driving conditions. To defend the road, two defensive lines were constructed on top of the ice, eight kilometers from the German-held shore. They included machine gun nests and ice trenches. The road was also protected by anti-aircraft guns and air cover. But German bombs and shells still claimed many victims. In the first week alone, 52 trucks were lost. Despite these extraordinary efforts to keep the city supplied and to get the civilians out, 53,000 Leningraders died in December, most from starvation. There were reports of people dropping dead in the street without warning. Each day, burial detachments had to remove 100 corpses from Leningrad's pavements. The diary of one Leningrader recorded how despair gave way to apathy. People now die in a very simple manner. First, they lose interest in everything. Then, they lie in bed and never rise again. They die as if falling asleep, and the surrounding people, half dead themselves, pay them no attention. Many drivers on the road of life made two trips every day, one by day, one by night. Dozens of trucks were wrecked in traffic accidents, more than were destroyed by German aircraft. So the order was given for vehicles to start using their headlights. Trucks that crashed through the ice sank so fast that for several minutes, the ghostly glow of their headlights could be seen at the bottom of the lake. Almost 300 trucks were lost in the first month of the road. But they had kept the city alive. Hundreds of thousands perished from starvation in that first winter. The scale of the suffering was almost beyond imagination. More than a million would die before this, the most devastating siege in history, was finally over. Leningrad, encircled by German and Finnish forces, witnessed hundreds of civilian deaths every day. But these were not collateral casualties. Hitler had decided that Leningrad should be wiped off the map. Secret orders entitled The Future of Leningrad stated, after Soviet Russia has been defeated 
the further existence of this population center is of no interest. In this war for existence, we have no interest in keeping even part of this great city's population. For the Soviet Union, it was vital that Leningrad be held at all costs. It was an important industrial city with many factories and the home base of the Baltic fleet. Its loss would mean the loss of the northern port of Murmansk, where the Arctic convoys arrived carrying military aid from Britain and America. And for many, Leningrad remained the cultural and spiritual capital of the USSR. Its fate was watched by people from across the Soviet Union. They came to see their fate entwined with that of the city. The Soviet High Command decided to breach the encirclement at its thinnest point, the schlieselberg sinyavina corridor. Here, only 10 kilometers separated troops of the Red Army's Leningrad Front from the front line of the Volkov Front. But it was heavily defended with three lines of fortifications. On the night of the 19th of September, a small force led by Captain Vasily Dubik crossed the Neva River in fishing boats. His men quietly landed on the far bank and took the German trenches by surprise. With this foothold across the river, a Soviet Marine Brigade moved rapidly to reinforce Dubik's position. This strip of land, called by the soldiers the Nevsky Piatachok, the Neva patch would become legendary. Two German parachute regiments, redeployed from Crete, were amongst the reinforcements sent to crush the Soviet bridgehead. They were plunged straight into the ferocious fighting. They failed to eliminate the bridgehead, but had squeezed it until it was just two kilometers long and 500 meters deep. In October, this tiny strip of land was the only hope for lifting the siege of Leningrad. All Red Army reserves were on their way to Moscow, where another desperate battle raged. The struggle at the bridgehead was brutal, attritional warfare. German shells swept back and forth across the whole area, forcing the Soviet soldiers to dig deep to find cover. Another attempt to break through was planned for November. By now, bread rations in the city were down to 125 grams. They weren't much more for frontline soldiers. One commander conducted an exercise to test the strength of his men. Most were exhausted after walking just 400 meters. In a speech at Munich on the 8th of November, Hitler declared, Leningrad has nothing to count upon. It will fall sooner or later. There are no forces to raise the siege. Leningrad is doomed to die from starvation. At the beginning of November, the Red Army got tanks across the Neva and captured more German trenches. In turn, the Germans fed in their own reinforcements. In November, the Red Army lost 5,000 men, killed in the Neva patch. The Germans, too, suffered heavy losses. The tiny bridgehead had become a slaughterhouse. In Leningrad itself, 4,000 were dying every day from starvation. On some days, this figure rose to 7,000. January 1942 became the worst month of the entire siege. Non-workers had their food ration stopped entirely. The electricity supply failed. Water pipes froze solid in temperatures of minus 30 degrees centigrade. Furniture, wooden fences, anything that would burn was used for firewood. One Leningrader, Yelena Skriabina, wrote in her diary, death has become a phenomenon observed at every turn. 
when you step outside in the morning, you stumble over corpses lying in the gateway and in the street. The dead bodies lie there for a long time because there's nobody to dispose of them. Even in the worst months of the siege, the people of Leningrad still went to work. The Kirov factory, just four kilometers from the front line, didn't stop producing tanks for a single day. Half-assembled tanks were even used to fire on the enemy from the factory floor. The Leningrad Institute of Plant Industry was dedicated to the research of commercial crops. It contained the world's largest seed bank. 28 institute workers died from starvation during the siege. But the plant breeding collection containing several tons of crops, rice and potatoes remained intact. In February 1942, the food situation gradually began to improve. The ration was increased to 500 grams for workers, 400 grams for office workers, 300 grams for children and non-workers. The revolting additives to the bread were used less and less. People now received their rations on time and almost in full. On the 16th of February, meat in the form of frozen beef and mutton was distributed amongst the population for the first time in months. Things were starting to look up. So far in the war, the Red Army's prospects of lifting the Leningrad siege had been limited because the fighting around Moscow had sucked up all available reserves. But by January 1942, the German army was retreating from Moscow. Now, a large-scale operation was possible at Leningrad. Soviet divisions on the Volkhov River prepared to assault the flank and rear of German Army Group North. Swampy, broken ground meant that tanks were of little use. The success of this offensive will be down to the infantry and the artillery. Meanwhile, General Fijaninsky was put in command of the 54th Army, tasked with breaking through to the besieged city. The Germans turned the high railway embankment near the village of Pogostye into a formidable earthwork. Red Army losses were horrendous. Their progress, minimal. The second shock army under General Klekov attacked German positions near the town of Lyuban to the south of the fortified corridor. But in their haste to raise the siege, the Stavka High Command ordered attacks that were not properly planned and lacked proper artillery support. One divisional commander, General Antufeyev, reported, after crossing the river and climbing the left bank, 
our infantry came under intense machine gun and mortar fire. Our artillery couldn't suppress the enemy fire. It couldn't even make a proper ranging and didn't have enough ammunition. The survivors had to return to their starting positions. Red Army units had advanced 30 kilometers through the frozen forests and swamps. It was the same distance again to reach Leningrad. The threat of encirclement hovered over the German troops. The logical decision seemed to be to order a retreat, but Hitler had forbidden any more retreats. Field Marshal von Lee, commander of Army Group North, asked to be relieved of command. General von Kuchler was now in charge. Von Kuchler concentrated on holding key roads and railways. This approach was the German salvation. Army Group North was able to keep its units resupplied and reserves could be moved quickly to threatened areas. Meanwhile, the lead units of the Second Shock Army had to be supplied by the only road that ran along a corridor just five kilometers wide between the villages of Zamosia and Spaskiopolis. The forward units were short of ammunition, food and fuel. The Soviet offensive was called off in February. Now the men prepared to defend the ground they'd captured. But it wasn't easy digging in, in the middle of a swamp. And the supply problems meant many soldiers began to suffer from malnutrition. In March, Hitler demanded that von Kuchler encircle the Soviet troops that had dented the German line. The operation was codenamed Wild Beast. A simultaneous assault by five German divisions effectively sealed off the Soviet penetration. The Soviet Second Shock Army was virtually cut off from the rest of the army. Just a tiny corridor, 1.5 to 2 kilometers wide, was left open. All that remained was for the Germans to crush the encircled Soviet units. But first, they launched a fresh assault against the Neva patch. By April, a thousand Soviet soldiers were dug in there. The Germans waited until the River Neva was full of drifting ice, making it impossible for the Soviets to reinforce the bridgehead. Then they unleashed a torrential artillery barrage. The last sign of life seen from across the river was a crude banner bearing the single word, help. Meanwhile, the encircled Second Shock Army received a new commander, Lieutenant General Andrei Vlasov. By the beginning of May, the Stavka had decided to try to extricate the remnants of this battered force. But the day before the planned withdrawal, the Germans attacked. The Soviets fought desperately to hold the perimeter as units began to withdraw through the tiny corridor back to the front line. But it was slow progress, and four days later, the Germans finally cut off the Second Shock Army. A Soviet artillery officer recorded conditions inside the pocket. The entire area was swept by German fire, the dead and wounded lay all around. Some were delirious. Others cried out for water to drink. Some even asked us to shoot them because they couldn't do it themselves. The Germans didn't attack. They kept us trapped like an animal in its lair and bombed and shelled without mercy. The last soldiers to escape slipped out under cover of darkness. By the end of June, 10,000 had got away but the Germans had 30,000 prisoners. Amongst them was the commander of the Second Shock Army, General Andrei Vlasov. Vlasov agreed to cooperate with his German captors and became a willing tool of Nazi propaganda. He wrote pamphlets entitled The Appeal of the Russian Liberation Committee to soldiers and commanders of the Red Army. And why have I taken up the struggle against Bolshevism? In them, he appealed to Red Army soldiers to join a new 
anti-Bolshevik Russian Liberation Army. Vlasov helped to recruit Russian prisoners of war to fight against Stalin. General Vlasov became so notorious that Russians referred to all Soviets who sided with the Germans as Vlasovtsi. But most had no allegiance to General Vlasov. The so-called Heavies were Soviet prisoners of war who helped the Germans in non-combat roles. And many anti-Bolsheviks and nationalists from the USSR fought in their own Wehrmacht units, known as the Eastern Legions. Most of Vlasov's Russian Liberation Army was captured near Prague in 1945. Its men were sent to the Gulag. Vlasov and other officers were hanged as traitors. The Red Army had failed to break the Leningrad siege in the spring of 1942. Now, the road of life across Lake Ladoga began to melt. On just one day, the 20th of April, about 80 trucks were lost through the thinning ice. The road of life was closed to heavy vehicles. The Russians waited anxiously for the lake to open to shipping. They knew that when it did, ships and ports would come under heavy air and artillery attack. The severe winter meant it wasn't until the 22nd of May that the lake was clear of drifting ice. The first ships made their crossings, evacuating civilians and bringing in supplies. Soviet air defences proved highly effective. Only 1% of incoming supplies were lost to German air attack. The Germans sent for Italian MAS torpedo boats, which had proved effective in the Mediterranean, and Siebel armed ferries, which had been designed for the invasion of England. But despite grand expectations, Axis naval forces failed to make an impact. Russian tugs and barges had an extremely shallow draft, so torpedoes passed harmlessly underneath them. Their naval bases and ships were hit hard by the Red Army Air Force. Axis naval operations were abandoned. It remained critical to break the siege of Leningrad. The road of life, by water or ice, brought in the bare minimum to keep the city fed and the troops supplied with fuel and ammunition. Six months later, in November 1942, the front commanders, General Zhukov and Marshal Voroshilov, began to plan Operation Iskra. It was decided to attack once more at the bottleneck, where the German encirclement was thinnest. Units of the Volkov Front would attack from without, as troops of the Leningrad Front attacked from within. The artillery barrage began at dawn on the 12th of January, 1943. As the last shells whistled overhead, the assault began. But everywhere, the Red Army ran into fierce resistance from well-entrenched German troops. T-34s could only crawl across what was effectively a heavily cratered peat bog. They were easy pickings for the German anti-tank guns. But the simultaneous attack on both fronts began to bear fruit. After two days, just two kilometers separated the Soviet troops. These final meters proved the hardest. Soviet tanks were knocked out or got stuck in the bog. It was up to the infantry to storm the German positions. General Fedyaninsky, now deputy front commander, repeatedly visited the front line to urge his men on. He ordered attacks around the clock. There was to be no let-up for the German defenders. The German tactic, as before, was to hold key positions along the transport network. Work settlements number one and number five on the only road between the lake and the rail terminus were turned into fortresses. If the Red Army could just cut the road, the German defense was doomed. Von Kuchler had to decide whether to hold on or withdraw from the bottleneck. He opted to hold on. 
Under unrelenting assault from both sides, the German defences began to crumble. The Red Army, sustaining massive losses all the way, fought through the intricate German defences. At the last moment, German units at Schlieselberg made a dash for safety, but not many made it. At midnight on the 18th of January 1943, Yuri Levitan, the voice of Soviet wartime radio, was able to announce, after seven days of fighting, troops of the Volkov and Leningrad fronts met on the 18th of January and raised the siege of Leningrad. In just three weeks, a railway was built across the cratered landscape of the bottleneck. It was just five kilometers from the German lines and under constant shell fire. Leningrad was still on the front line, but at last it was getting enough food and fuel. The Red Army lacked the strength to push the Germans back any further. The reserves of German Army Group North had arrived and were dug in on the high ground. German defences were traditionally built around the MG-34 or the MG-42 machine gun. The rest of the infantry were effectively there to support the machine gun team. By autumn 1943, the Red Army had developed tactics for attacking German infantry. Soviet rifle platoons, supported by artillery and mortars, aimed to wipe out enemy machine gun positions in the first few minutes of the assault. The remaining rifle-armed Germans would be seriously outgunned by Soviet troops armed with submachine guns. But from late 1943, the Germans began to change the balance once more with the introduction of the MP43. Now, if the infantry squad's machine gun team was knocked out, a squad armed with the new MP43s could still provide heavy, accurate fire against enemy attackers. Hitler himself gave the new weapon its name, Sturmgewehr, the assault rifle. It wasn't until the beginning of 1944 that the Stavka launched the operation that would finally end the siege of Leningrad. By then, German Army Group North had had nearly two years to dig in on the outskirts of the city. The Stavka planned to begin the operation at the Oranian-bound bridgehead, which had stubbornly held out against the Germans thanks to the heavy guns of its coastal fort. From here, the Red Army would launch itself against the flank of German Army Group North. Leading the attack would be General Fedyaninsky at the head of the Second Shock Army, which had been secretly redeployed to the bridgehead under the cover of darkness. By attacking from the coast, the massive firepower of the Baltic fleet could be used to support the assault, with more than a hundred heavy naval guns available for the operation. They included the guns of the battleship Mara, refloated after being sunk by Stukas in 1941, and the enormous coastal guns of the Krasnaya Gorka fort. The assault began on the 14th of January 1944. Soviet newspapers and radio carried no reports about the operation, but the people of Leningrad could hear the distant thunder of the bombardment. They knew what it meant, that the final offensive was underway, the one that would end the siege once and for all. No one doubted its success. The attack from Oranienbaum caught Army Group North by surprise. In the face of an overwhelming Soviet assault, German defences collapsed. A week later, Soviet troops, laden with captured trophies, met at the town of Ropsha. German Army Group North retreat became a rout. The front line raced away from Leningrad. The rumble of guns receded into the distance. At long last, silence descended over the city of Leningrad. According to official reports, 642,000 civilians died during the siege of Leningrad. But many deaths never made it into an official report. The real total was probably nearer one million. 3% were caused by bombs and shells, 97% by starvation. About 1.8 million people were evacuated from Leningrad during the war. By 1945, 
the city's population was just one-fifth of what it had been at the start of the war. This was the longest siege of a large city in World War II and the costliest siege in history. Army Group North was bogged down in the forests and swamps around Leningrad for more than two years. It comprised one-fifth of German strength on the Eastern Front. But pinned outside Leningrad, it was unable to influence the war's decisive battles, all of which were fought on other fronts. Far to the south, in the vast open expanse between Kharkov and the Volga River, the Red Army would have to learn to fight another kind of war, highly mobile armoured warfare. And it was here in the south in 1942 that the world would learn the name of another Soviet city, Stalingrad. Red Army was pulling back across the Volga. Suddenly, enormous explosions ripped through the city behind them. The ammunition and fuel dumps in Rezhev were being blown up to prevent them falling into enemy hands. Everywhere, there was confusion. The roads were crowded with retreating soldiers. No one knew where it would end. It seemed the whole front was collapsing. It was October 1941. The Germans had launched Operation Typhoon, the battle for Moscow. The German army was in Rezhev, just hours behind the Soviets. An investigation into the conduct of Soviet commanders at Rezhev cleared them of wrongdoing. There had been no way to get the ammunition out. The Luftwaffe had already destroyed all transport connections to the city. The Red Army ammunition dumps were at Rezhev because the city lay at the heart of the rail network. Both sides depended on ammunition, food and fuel by the train load. It made Rezhev a valuable prize. Red Army units retreating from Rezhev were reorganized into the Kalinin Front. Their new commander was Colonel General Ivan Stepanovich Konyev. Konyev was the son of Russian peasants and became a conscript of the Tsarist Army in 1916. By 1941, he'd risen to senior command and was put in charge of a front, the Soviet equivalent of an army group. However, his forces became encircled in the opening phase of Operation Typhoon. Konyev's conduct was investigated by the State Defense Committee, led by Molotov and Voroshilov. Konyev's predecessor, General Pavlov, had been shot 
following a similar investigation. But Konyev was saved by Zhukov's intervention. Zhukov knew any general could have a bad day. And shooting competent officers with the enemy at the gates of the capital was counterproductive. That winter, outside Moscow, the Red Army launched a massive counterattack. The German 9th Army was forced to retreat from Kalinin back to Rozhev. Hitler's response was to sack Army Group Center's commander, Fedor von Bock. He was given just a few hours to brief his successor, Field Marshal von Kluger. Von Bock painted a bleak picture. He warned von Kluger that he believed the enemy was preparing a powerful strike against both flanks of Army Group Center. Gunther von Kluger had been promoted field marshal the previous year, following his success in the Battle of France. He came from a Prussian family with a long tradition of military service. In 1944, he would take his own life, following the failure of the army plot to assassinate Hitler. Von Bock's warning proved accurate. As Zhukov attacked from the east, Konyev's 39th Army broke through the German lines west of Rezhev, threatening Army Group Center's supply lines. The Soviet 29th Army followed through the breach, threatening Rezhev itself. The Germans clung on desperately. Heinrich Harper, a medic in the German 6th Infantry Division, described the chaos. We got reinforcements from construction companies and rear units. Many didn't know anything about handling weapons. They were cannon fodder thrown into the battle. While we changed positions after firing, the newcomers always shot from the same spot. One burst from a Russian machine gun was all it took. In 12 hours, from 130 new men, 26 were left. Konyev's counterattack encircled the German 23rd Corps near Olenina. But Zhukov's advance became bogged down in fighting around Yuknov. Only Bilov's cavalry corps broke through to Vyazma. Because of the almost total destruction of Red Army tank units in the first weeks of the war, by late 1941, the Soviets were forced to look elsewhere for fast-moving offensive units. They turned to their cavalry. The cavalry was used to exploit breakthroughs and attack enemy lines of communication. Each cavalry corps included one tank brigade, anti-tank guns and mortars. The cavalry were, in effect, mobile infantry. Horses got them there, but then the men dismounted to fight and the horses were led to the rear. Mounted cavalry charges were for the newsreels. Later in the war, the Red Army created cavalry mechanized groups containing cavalry, tanks, self-propelled guns and rocket artillery. These formations were powerful and highly mobile. On the 16th of January, General Strauss asked to be relieved as commander of the German 9th Army. His replacement was Walter Model. Model now turned the tables on the Soviets. First, he broke through to the isolated 23rd Corps. Then he cut off the Soviet 29th Army. Konyev launched ferocious counterattacks in a bid to rescue his trapped units. But Model successfully parried one blow after another. The Soviets failed to break through. Konyev ordered the encircled men to save themselves. On the 17th of February, a small airborne force was parachuted in to guide the troops back through the lines. 
5,200 men of the 29th Army made it back. 14,000 did not. The Soviet plan to cut the Smolensk-Vyazma Highway, thereby cutting off German Army Group Center, had ended in a bloody failure. The losses were extraordinary, but casualty claims remain controversial. The Soviets admitted to a staggering 341,000 casualties on the Kalinin Front. The Western Front suffered an additional 105,000 casualties, while German Army Group Center sustained an estimated 150,000 casualties. Summer 1942. The drone of a light aircraft could be heard over the forest and the occasional crack of a rifle. Field Marshal von Kluger was indulging in his new hobby, fox hunting from the air. It was a dangerous sport. Partisans and stranded Red Army soldiers hid in the forest. Model had recently been wounded by a lucky shot. After the winter fighting, many Soviet units were cut off behind the German front line. The front here had become a confusing patchwork of pockets and salients. The largest salient projected into the forests around the town of Zhukovsky. It contained parts of the Soviet 39th Army and 11th Cavalry Corps. They were supplied along a narrow corridor through enemy lines. Artillery officer Mikhail Lukinov described conditions. There weren't many of us, and no one was in good shape. All the horses had died. The sick and wounded were taken out on foot, and some of us envied them. The Stavka was not willing to give up any of its hard-won ground, no matter how exposed it left the troops. And now, disaster loomed. On the 2nd of July, the Germans launched Operation Seidlitz. Within three days, they had closed the corridor at the village of Pushkari. It meant the encirclement of the 39th Army, the 11th Cavalry Corps, and also parts of the 41st and 22nd Armies. Attempts to break out lasted for several days. Polyakov, a signals officer from a guard's rifle division, described the atmosphere. At headquarters, there was a sense of calm foreboding. You could sense people thinking, we've done all we can. Now duty demands we go to the very end. But while his troops fought bravely on, 39th Army Commander General Maslenikov was evacuated by air. His injured deputy, General Ivan Bogdanov, was also flown out, but died of his wounds. 18,000 soldiers escaped the trap. More than 60,000 did not. Operation Seidlitz gave the Rzhev bulge its definitive shape. At its tip, the city of Rzhev and the junction of two rail arteries, one running east-west from Moscow to Veliki Luki, the other running north-south from Torzhok to Vyazma. German control of Rzhev prevented the Soviets moving men and supplies between the two flanks. But if Rzhev fell, the Red Army would be able to launch powerful offensives on both flanks. They would trap and destroy German forces in the salient. What's more, the German lines here were only 150 kilometers from the Soviet capital. It was imperative that Soviet forces drive the enemy as far from Moscow as possible. In July 1942, the Wehrmacht launched a new offensive in southern Russia to capture the Caucasus oil fields. The Red Army retreated towards Rostov and Stalingrad. Stalin issued his famous Order Number 227, 
not a step back. At the Rejev salient, the fighting had settled into a routine of bombardments and small-scale raids. For the Eastern Front, this was what passed for a quiet patch. But it was the calm before the storm. The Soviets were preparing something big. B-4 guns, dubbed Stalin sledgehammers, had arrived at the front. The B-4 was a Soviet 203mm heavy howitzer. It was a fearsome weapon, used for smashing enemy fortifications and strong points. B-4 batteries were under the direct command of the Stavka Strategic Reserve, this meant that wherever they showed up, something big was being planned. The explosion of a 100-kilogram B-4 shell would instantly catch the Germans' attention. So to keep the presence of the heavy guns secret, gunners carried out their ranging fire with light howitzers. The results were then recalculated for the B-4s. But that wasn't all the Soviets were hiding. The new M30 rocket launcher was about to make its operational debut. M30s were similar to the famous Katyusha truck-mounted rocket launchers, but this version carried a heavier 300mm rocket with a bulbous warhead, which meant the launcher had to be installed directly into the ground. Each M30 could be loaded with four or later eight rockets. It was a crude but devastating weapon, nicknamed Pounding Ivan by the troops. Each rocket had a range of 2.8 kilometers. Later in the war, an M31 rocket was developed with a range of more than four kilometers. It was fired from a car-mounted launcher known as Andriusha. The front line was quiet when Leonid Sandalov chief of staff of the 20th Army, went to visit. On a clear day, you could see German guards changing shifts, smoke coming from dugouts, and soldiers bailing out their trenches with buckets. In the evenings, you could hear them playing their harmonicas. These routines were carefully observed by Red Army staff officers disguised as common soldiers. This sector, near the Derja River, had been chosen by the Stavka High Command for an ambitious operation. The orders from the Stavka were to seize control of the cities of Rezhev and Zubtsov, and then to advance to fortify the lines of the Volga and Vazuza rivers. The attack was to be made by two armies of the Kalinin Front and two armies of the Western Front. It would commence on the 28th of July, 1942. But the Germans were preparing their own offensive. Paul, wie geht es Russen in ihren Stellungen? Alles ist eigentlich ruhig. The Germans planned to attack at Sukinishki, where there was a bulge in the front. Operation Whirlwind would be the classic German pincer move. Two blows from north and south to encircle Soviet troops in the bulge. Summer rainstorms turned roads into swamps. The Western Front's attack had to be delayed. But Konyev's Kalinin front went ahead without them on the 30th of July. Its troops had been given two days to capture Rezhev. General Khladnikov, the Kalinin front's artillery commander, reported the effects of his barrage. Two of the forward positions of the enemy's main defensive line were destroyed. The forces occupying them were almost completely wiped out. 
But Modol used the German 6th Infantry Division to plug any gaps that appeared in the line. Battles raged for days over villages and landmarks. To the north of Rezhev, Polonino village and Hill 200 were the focus of bitter fighting. A battalion commander from the 6th Infantry Division tried to describe the experience. Our trenches were under constant artillery and mortar fire. It's hard to imagine the sheer number of guns, the indescribable sound of the rockets. The wounded drag themselves to the rear. They say it's all bad in the front line. The Russians destroy our guns and are leveling our positions. But still, the Soviet infantry failed to break through. Soviet infantry tactics weren't helping. In 1942, Red Army doctrine stated that infantry should be drawn up in two echelons. For a division, this meant two regiments in the first echelon and one behind. Their battalions and companies were arranged in the same way. It allowed a division to move quickly to exploit a successful attack. It also meant that in a rifle division, only eight out of 27 companies were in the front line. Attacks were weakened, and units in the rear were exposed to shells and bombs long before they'd even engaged the enemy. In the bloody fighting around Rezhev, the Red Army would learn many painful lessons. The 4th of August, 1942. The dawn silence was about to be broken by a deafening cannonade. Stalin's sledgehammers had joined the battle. Then, the Katyushas joined in. Five days late, Zhukov's Western Front had joined the battle. As Zhukov's troops advanced, they liberated their first Russian village. At Pegoroloi Gorodisha, they learned firsthand about the brutality of Nazi occupation. Jews had been murdered. Russians starved, or transported to the Reich as forced labor. From a population of 3,076, only 905 remained. In two days of slow and costly advances, the 20th Army reached the Vazuza and Gajak rivers. Now, it had to storm across them, take Sitchevka, and so cut the vital vyazma rozhev rail line. Modol hurriedly redeployed the five divisions, three of them armored, that had been earmarked for Operation Whirlwind. The attacking Red Army units were decimated. Zhukov was forced onto the defensive. He turned his attention to the village of Kamanovo on his left flank. It was a virtual fortress, protected by the Yalze River in front and impenetrable swamps on both flanks. For the Soviet infantry, it meant more suicidal frontal assaults. <laughs> 
On the 21st of August, the Kalinin Front finally took Polonino and advanced to the outskirts of Rzhev. The Western Front managed to outflank Kamanovo. The village fell on the 23rd of August. Modol demanded that von Kluger release three more divisions to help shore up 9th Army's position. He got them. With these reinforcements and his skillful handling of the tactical situation, Modol was able to fight the Soviet offensive to a standstill. Red Army gains had fallen far short of expectations. Stalin now telephoned Zhukov at Western Front headquarters. He told him, you must report to the Stavka as soon as possible. Think carefully about who will take over from you there. Stalin was sending Zhukov south to oversee the defense of Stalingrad. Zhukov had named Ivan Konyev as his successor at Western Front headquarters. Konyev immediately ordered a new strategy. There would be no more attempts to cut the railway at Sitchevka. Instead, Konyev would concentrate all his resources on driving the Germans out of Rzhev. New offensives were launched in late August. Konyev seemed on the brink of victory. But once more, Modol received reinforcements in the nick of time. They included the elite Großdeutschland Motorized Infantry Division. This unit exemplified the superior equipment, tactics and training still possessed by the German army. In October, the Soviets were forced to abandon their offensive. The Rzhev sector began to quieten down. That summer, Modal's 9th Army had lost 60,000 men. Soviet casualties were 314,000 men, more than five times as many. Red Army soldiers called it the Rzhev meat grinder. Alexander Bodner was in the midst of it. We'd never attacked in the summer before that. And we didn't know how to attack the summer German. I was a kilometer behind the front. And suddenly, I saw a field covered with our dead. Young boys with guard badges, wearing brand new uniforms. The German machine gunner was just mowing them down. We were still learning how to fight from the Germans right up until Stalingrad. But after Stalingrad, we had nothing to learn. We knew everything. The Russian poet, Alexander Trifonovich Tvardovsky, gave a voice to the dead. I was killed near Rzhev in a nameless bog in 5th Company, on the left flank, in a cruel air raid. I did not hear the explosions and did not see the flash. Down to an abyss from a cliff, no start, no end. And in this whole world, till the end of its days, neither patches nor badges from my tunic you'll find. November 1942. 
At a Red Army Air Force base near Moscow, air crew rushed to inspect a brand new arrival. This sleek new twin-engine bomber was the Tupolev Tu-2. The Tu-2 was a high-speed bomber with a crew of four. It was armed with two 20mm cannon, three defensive machine guns, and could carry more than three tons of bombs. The designer, Andrei Nikolaevich Tupolev, worked for the aviation design bureau known as OKB-29. They were based at 24 Radio Street, Moscow, where they were closely supervised by the NKVD secret police. Most Soviet wartime designers and engineers worked under similar supervision by the authorities, some whilst under actual arrest. The Germans still held Rajev and the crucial rail hub. It made it difficult to resupply the Kalinin front for a fresh assault. So the Stavka allocated it more transport aircraft to get supplies in by air. It was all part of the build-up to a new offensive, codenamed Operation Mars. In November 1942, the Red Army planned to encircle German forces at Stalingrad in Operation Uranus. Mars would be a simultaneous hammer blow at Rajev that would prevent the Wehrmacht sending reinforcements south. Zhukov, who had been in the south acting as the Stavka's representative on the Stalingrad front, would return north to command Operation Mars personally. The offensive would be carried out by Konyev's Western Front and the Kalinin Front, now commanded by General Maxim Pokayev. Zhukov would oversee them both. The Red Army would attack with 660,000 men and 2,000 tanks. It was clear that Zhukov hoped for a significant breakthrough. On the first day of the operation, a harsh wind blew from the southwest, bringing heavy grey clouds. Wet snow fell from the sky. Visibility was down to 20 yards. Zhukov and Konyev had placed great emphasis on close air support, but nothing could fly in this weather. There was no question of postponing the attack. On the west side of the Rajev salient, one Soviet mechanized corps broke through the positions of a Luftwaffe field division, while Katukov's third mechanized corps advanced along the Luchesi Valley. Model and von Kluger committed all their forces to the battle. Supreme High Command reserves were now en route to Army Group Center from Smolensk. From the east of the salient, Soviet tanks and cavalry briefly cut the railway line to Rajev. But with the help of an armoured train, the Germans threw them back. The Red Army sent wave after wave into the attack. But the German defences were well organised and held by well-armed, experienced troops. Soviet losses were enormous. But the German high command foresaw disaster. If defences around Belia crumbled, the whole salient could be cut off and destroyed. The fighting in the Lucchesi Valley would prove critical. Here, the Germans finally managed to contain the Soviet advance. Far to the south, Field Marshal von Manstein was preparing an offensive to rescue German forces trapped at Stalingrad. It was codenamed Operation Winter Storm. But there were serious concerns that it lacked the strength to break through to Stalingrad. When von Manstein asked for more divisions, he was told no. The strategic reserve had already been committed at Rajev. <laughs> 
As Operation Mars continued, German infantry fought a bloody struggle in freezing conditions for a handful of vital highways and railway lines. Elite German units who fought here would remember these months as the worst of the entire war. Katukov's third mechanized corps was just two kilometers short of cutting the highway to Rezhev. He was down from 270 tanks to just 70. But Operation Mars could go no further. By the 20th of December, the offensive had ground to a halt. The Red Army was still outmatched by the Wehrmacht. Although in some arenas, such as sniping, the Soviets were highly proficient, they still lacked crucial capabilities. Many lives were being wasted in repeated frontal attacks on German strongpoints. Their tanks and infantry still hadn't learned to work together effectively. The Red Army often lacked good intelligence of enemy forces. One captured Soviet officer told the Germans he'd been shocked when their reserves arrived. A German intelligence report picked up this point. The enemy wasn't counting on these troops appearing. No German reserve forces are marked on any of the Soviet maps we've recovered. Soviet statistics put casualties for Operation Mars at 216,000. They may have been much higher. German 9th Army casualties were 53,000. Von Kluger, commander of Army Group Center, was awarded the Oak Leaf Cluster to his Knight's Cross. But in secret, the Field Marshal was already plotting against Hitler. In July 1944, von Kluger was in France commanding the Western Front when von Stauffenberg tried to blow up the Führer at his headquarters in East Prussia. When it became clear the plot had failed, von Kluger took a cyanide pill. He was succeeded by his former subordinate, Walter Model, who would also later commit suicide to avoid Soviet war crimes charges. There were no medals for the Red Army commanders. Konyev was relieved of command, but he was soon back in favor. He later led the first Ukrainian front into Germany and Berlin. The commander of the Kalinin front, Maxim Pokayev, was reassigned to the Far East, where he remained for the rest of the war. Operation Mars was a bloody defeat for the Red Army, and it was a personal failure for Marshal Zhukov. For these reasons, the events were largely ignored by Soviet historians and are hardly known in the West. But despite the enormous casualties, the offensive did achieve something. Army Group Center's reserves had been pinned down at Rezhev. It meant they had not been available to assist von Manstein's rescue operation at Stalingrad. General Model's 9th Army had suffered heavy casualties too. These were experienced officers and men that Germany would struggle to replace. In January 1943, Veliki Luki was liberated, a town 250 kilometers west of Rezhev. The loss of this important transport hub hampered German supply and put the Rezhev salient in an even more precarious situation. On the 26th of January, 1943, von Kluger requested permission to withdraw from the Rezhev salient. Five days later, Paulus surrendered at Stalingrad. Hitler, suddenly anxious to avoid another encirclement, gave von Kluger permission to retreat. 9th Army would be vulnerable as it withdrew from the salient, so its staff had begun planning the retreat even before Hitler's permission came through. The result was codenamed Buffalo, a massive operation 
to move 365,000 men to new prepared positions 100 kilometers to the rear. As the Germans prepared to withdraw, they launched a large-scale anti-partisan operation. They rounded up Red Army stragglers and many innocent civilians too. All face swift and summary punishment. A corporal from the 4th Panzer Division described how such operations were conducted. Our patrol arrested an old man and six-year-old boy carrying potatoes and salt. They claimed they were going fishing, but they were obviously delivering food to the partisans. We didn't detain them for too long. We sent them on their way to paradise. In the East, such crimes had become commonplace. Now, as the Germans retreated, Modell gave orders to deport all males of working age confiscate all food supplies, poison wells, and burn villages. For these actions, he would be declared a war criminal by the USSR. The German retreat began on the 1st of March, 1943. Engineers waited to blow the Volga Bridge after the last unit had crossed. Hitler had demanded to hear the explosion for himself. It was carried by telephone line back to Führer headquarters. Across no man's land, a Russian medic noticed something was up. A strange silence filled the air. Not a sound, neither from the German side nor ours. Slowly, our men left their trenches. More and more of those daredevils with every minute. Then I heard a cry. Fritz has run away. The German withdrawal was conducted in stages. In their wake, they left landmines and booby traps. Modal's scorched earth policy spared nothing. When the Red Army liberated Vyazma, they found total devastation. Every building had been demolished or gutted. Every telegraph pole had been cut down. Every railway point smashed. Even oil drums had been riddled with bullets. German soldiers spoke of having left Rejev undefeated. But the reality was that they were retreating to avoid a second Stalingrad. The battles of Rajev saw some of the most ferocious, futile bloodletting of the entire war. Red Army casualties were estimated at 1.2 million. The only recompense was that the Germans too had suffered appallingly. On the 3rd of April 1943, Modell was awarded the swords to his Knight's Cross. He was also told to prepare his Ninth Army for a new offensive. Operation Citadel. The general had no illusions about the prospects for this new offensive. His forces, although nominally large, contained many units worn down and exhausted by the long winter fighting. Now, they were to be thrown into the white heat of the Battle of Kursk.
Early on the morning of the 19th of June, 1942, an unarmed German liaison plane glided to Earth near Red Army positions. There was no trail of smoke or obvious reason for its crash landing. When Soviet troops later captured the aircraft, they found a single bullet hole through its petrol tank. The pilot was killed in the shootout that followed before he could destroy his briefcase, which contained top secret documents. Red Army soldiers grabbed the prize and brought it back to their trenches. The dead German was Major Reichel, head of operations for the German 23rd Panzer Division. He was carrying plans for a forthcoming operation codenamed Case Blue. The offensive was part of Hitler's plan to capture the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus region. Major Reichel's documents revealed just a small part of the operation, and there was always the risk that they were planted by the Germans to deliberately mislead the enemy. After examining the captured papers, Stalin advised caution. It is safe to assume that similar plans have been developed for all the other fronts as well, he wrote. But Case Blue was for real. It was launched by the Wehrmacht on the 28th of June, 1942. Case Blue called for German Army Group South to split into two parts. Army Group A was to attack the Caucasus region and seize the Soviet oil fields. Army Group B, led by Paulus's 6th Army, was to advance eastwards towards the Volga River and Stalingrad, covering the advance into the Caucasus. The German columns dashed towards Voronezh, Stalingrad and Rostov-on-Don. Despite the warnings, the Red Army's southern sector hadn't received nearly enough reinforcements to withstand the impact. Soon, the Soviets were in full retreat. During a meeting of the Stavka, the Soviet High Command, Stalin turned to Front Commander Timoshenko and demanded, why does the Front Command not know where its troops are? As far as I recall, there were 14 divisions in those armies. That's over 100,000 soldiers. Timoshenko was removed from command within days. Vasily Gordov became the new Front Commander. But a new commander was not enough to salvage the situation. The army's retreat continued as one population center after another fell to the Nazis. Soviet soldiers surrendered in growing numbers. Many of them went across to the enemy, becoming the so-called Hivi. The term Hivi came from the German Hilfswilliger, meaning those willing to help. It referred to Soviet citizens, including ex-soldiers, who volunteered to help the German armed forces. They usually served in support roles, such as drivers, medical orderlies, or cooks. As the Red Army retreat continued, Stalin issued his famous Order No. 227. It gave birth to the famous slogan, Not a Step Back. The order read, All talk about us having plenty of room in which to retreat endlessly, about our territory being vast, our country being large and rich, our population numerous, and they're always being bred in abundance. All this talk must be eliminated. We will not tolerate any commander or commissar who allows their unit to leave its positions without authorization. Panic mongers and cowards must be exterminated on the spot. So-called blocking detachments were created. These units had orders to fire on their own men if they tried to retreat. Many approved of the order. It should have been issued earlier, one Red Army soldier wrote. If it had, we wouldn't have given up our winter positions. Many thought the order would prove impossible to enforce. The blocking detachments were really more than a few hundred strong and often made up of the worst soldiers in the unit. The four blocking detachments of the 62nd Army totaled 650 men. They were expected to enforce a no-retreat order on an army of 56,000 men. In reality, blocking detachments were only good for rounding up malingerers and sending them back to the front. 
but new slogans and blocking detachments were not going to stop the Wehrmacht. In crowded railway stations across the Soviet Empire, new recruits were ordered aboard their railway transports. From all corners of the land, troop trains rolled towards the River Don. Meanwhile, German troops were continuing their advance on Stalingrad. The 6th Army had almost reached the Don, but its commander was uneasy. Friedrich Paulus had served as chief of staff in various army divisions since 1935. He'd helped to plan Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the USSR. When Field Marshal von Reichenau, commander of the 6th Army, died of natural causes, Paulus was given command. Paulus's superiors described him as clever and talented, but questions remained about his decisiveness. With his staff officer background, Paulus had more the air of a civil servant than a general. He was not lionized by his men, as his predecessor von Reichenau had been. It was Paulus's lot to be constantly compared to von Reichenau, much to his irritation. The 6th Army consisted of 270,000 men, 3,400 guns and mortars, and 350 tanks, supported by 1,100 aircraft. The Soviet Stalingrad front could muster 300,000 troops, 5,500 guns, 230 tanks, and 1,000 aircraft. Although the Red Army had a numerical superiority, its forces had to cover a front of more than 500 kilometers. Paulus, in contrast, could gather his forces into a single fist, ready to smash east towards Stalingrad and the Volga. The Germans began their advance across the Don steppe. Here, the Don River, running north to south, comes very close to the River Volga before turning southwest to form a long bend. Within that bend, the Soviet armies dug in. The steep Don riverbank, between 25 and 30 meters high, made retreat difficult. A German breakthrough here could leave Soviet troops trapped on the wrong side of the river. For the Red Army, to stand and fight was the only option. The German offensive at the Don Bend began on the 17th of July, 1942. The Germans anticipated a rapid victory against an enemy they had defeated many times already. But stubborn resistance caused the fighting to drag on for many more days than expected. This holdup threatened the success of the entire German summer offensive. Paulus's army didn't reach Stalingrad, Army Group A, moving into the Caucasus, could easily become cut off by Soviet counterattacks. 4th Panzer Army, under General Hoth, now swung around to threaten Stalingrad from the south. The city, named after Stalin, was becoming the center of attention. Soon, all the eyes of the world would be upon it. By the end of August 1942, the German 6th Army had wiped out Soviet resistance west of the Don. Red Army survivors were retreating to the eastern bank of the Great River. The Germans were now only 60 kilometers from Stalingrad. Meanwhile, General Hoth tanks were approaching from the south. Hoth's 150-kilometer drive across the steppe allowed him to unexpectedly burst onto the enemy's flank. Soviet troops in this area were part of the Southeastern Front, commanded by General Yerimenka. Near a small railway station, southwest of Stalingrad, they greeted advancing German tanks with volley fire from Katyusha rocket launchers. 
Yerimenko reported to the Stavka High Command. Pilots whom I sent to reconnoiter the battlefield reported that the whole area is on fire. Every bit of it was burning. I conclude that the Katyushas made a lot of trouble there. Hoth's offensive was stopped in its tracks. This success led to Yurimenka's promotion. Soon, he was coordinating the actions of the southeastern and Stalingrad fronts in the defense of the city. Meanwhile, General Paulus's 6th Army was preparing to cross the River Don. Early on the morning of the 21st of August, more than 200 German assault boats were launched onto the waters of the Don. But the soldiers of the Stalingrad front were ready. The Germans were met with heavy fire. Dozens of boats were sunk. But the Germans got ashore and established a beachhead on the east bank of the Don. Soon a pontoon bridge was up and reinforcements flooded across. The next stop was Stalingrad. Stalingrad, known as Tsaritsyn before the revolution, was one of the most beautiful and well-planned cities in pre-war Russia. New factories attracted many young people to the city. In 15 years, its population grew from 85,000 to 450,000 people. The embankment, with its cafes, cinemas and public gardens, was considered the most elegant along the whole of the Volga. The population of Stalingrad had not been evacuated promptly. Only about 100,000, a fifth, had been evacuated by August. At noon on the 23rd of August, panzers of the 6th Army rolled towards Stalingrad. Above them roared the might of Air Fleet 4, saluting the soldiers with their sirens. They were en route to Stalingrad to unleash the heaviest bombing campaign yet seen on the Eastern Front. When the air raid sirens sounded, many people assumed it was a test. Only when the sky became dark with planes and anti-aircraft batteries opened fire, did people rush to the shelters. Bombs rained down on the city. Approximately 80% of buildings were destroyed in the first day of bombing. Most of Stalingrad's suburbs were built of wood. Inside the city itself, there were oil storage facilities and timber yards. The city was parched by the August sun. German incendiary bombs caused the whole city to flare up like gunpowder. Rivers of burning oil and petrol flowed towards the Volga. First the surface of the water, and then the ships caught fire. German Air Fleet 4, commanded by General von Richthofen, flew 1,500 missions on the 23rd of August. Its aircraft dropped 1,000 tons of bombs and lost only three aircraft. On that single day, an estimated 40,000 people died in Stalingrad. Most of the survivors fled the city. But some chose to stay and share the city's fate. At about 4 p.m., Paulus's tanks reached the Volga. Approaching Stalingrad from the north, all the Germans could see through their binoculars was fire and smoke. It seemed nothing could prevent the Germans from entering the burning city. And yet, their attempt to take Stalingrad in one swift assault was bloodily repulsed. What's more, infantry and tanks of the Stalingrad front launched a series of counterattacks from the north. Two reserve armies had also reached Stalingrad, 
They were joined by the two foremost strategists of the Red Army, Marshal Zhukov and Marshal Vasilevsky. Zhukov told Stalin, our swift strike caused the enemy troops to turn their forces away from Stalingrad and direct them against our grouping. This eased the situation in Stalingrad, which otherwise would have fallen to the enemy. A lull of several days followed the initial attack. Stalingrad was half encircled. The 62nd and 64th armies inside the city were cut off from the Stalingrad front. They could only be reinforced and supplied across the Volga River. But the German position was also far from ideal, having to fend off counterattacks from the north and from within Stalingrad itself. It had become clear that the Red Army could never be forced out of the ruins of the city as long as they received reinforcements and supplies. The original plan for Case Blue had paid little attention to the capture of Stalingrad. Paulus's new orders were to capture the city, destroy the river crossings, and then take up a defensive position. From Stalingrad, he would protect the flank of German forces advancing into the Caucasus. The taking of Stalingrad was regarded as a matter of a few weeks by the German general staff. But Paulus was less gung-ho when he arrived to meet Hitler in his headquarters near Vinitsa in Ukraine. His Sixth Army was far from the force it had been just two months before. It had suffered heavy casualties in the struggle at the Don. And Paulus now had to send his best divisions to defend a left flank that stretched all the way from the Don to the Volga. When Hitler asked him when he would take Stalingrad, Paulus answered, I cannot predict the final date in view of the state of our troops as well as the strength of Russian resistance. On the contrary, I must ask for reinforcement by at least three good divisions. Paulus's army got its reinforcements. Now, Hitler expected Stalingrad to be taken without delay. The 62nd Army was the only defense and hope for the city. It had already been reduced to about one-sixth of its normal strength. There were only about 50 tanks left. Damaged tanks, immobilized but still able to fire, were dug in and turned into fixed gun emplacements. But the city would not hold out for long without substantial reinforcement. On the 9th of September, General Rodimtsev's 13th Guards Rifle Division was dispatched to the city. Three days later, General Vasily Ivanovich Chuikov was put in command of the 62nd Army. At the outbreak of the Russian Revolution, Chuikov was a 17-year-old naval cadet at Kronstadt. By 19, he was commanding a regiment in the Russian Civil War and was twice decorated with the Order of the Red Banner. Chuikov arrived at the 62nd Army's headquarters on the 14th of September. The same day, the Germans began an all-out assault on the city. The German assault on Stalingrad found a weak point in the Soviet defenses, where the 112th Soviet Rifle Division had once stood. Its regiments had been reduced from 2,500 soldiers each to less than 100. Its artillery consisted of one howitzer and one gun of 1902 vintage. The Germans broke through the decimated division and captured the high ground of Mamayev Kurgan. Then they reached the Volga, hoping to seize the central river crossing. If they had succeeded, Stalingrad's fate would have been sealed that same day. Chuikov threw every available man into the battle. He had to buy time for Radimsev's division to cross the river. Every man able to fire a gun was dispatched to the front line. With the river at their backs and Chuikov's declaration that there is no land for us across the Volga, every man knew this was a fight to the death. By now, the Germans had gained control of the southern part of the city and had split Chuikov's 62nd Army from General Shumilov's 64th Army. The German capture of the city's huge grain elevator was seen as a turning point.
Paulus personally chose the grain elevator as the emblem for his soldier's victory badge. But German victory plans were a little premature. The Rodimtsev division prepared to cross the river by night. They had equipped themselves for street fighting, ditching long rifles in favor of submachine guns and anti-tank rifles. When German observers spotted movement on the river, they called in artillery fire, smashing boats and men and causing many to drown. The soldiers who reached the shore were instantly plunged into battle. The Germans occupied the high bank and had a perfect view of Soviet soldiers as they landed. The fighting was soon hand to hand. Men used bayonets, rifle butts and entrenching tools. In brutal, bloody fighting, the Soviets recaptured the embankment and Mill 4, which overlooked the river crossings. With the capture of this position, the river crossings were finally secure once more. Rodimtsev succeeded in forcing the Germans back and recapturing the railway station. His men regained Mameyev Kurgan on the 19th of September. The same day, the Stavka High Command ordered an attack by the Stalingrad Front to link up with the city's defenders. It was repulsed by the Germans, but much needed German manpower was drawn away from the fighting in the city. Fighting in the city raged for two weeks with hardly any respite. On the 27th of September, Paulus launched another assault. Chuikov's task was to hold the city and its industrial centers, but the city was consuming his men at a terrifying rate. Those who survived for any length of time learned new tactics for this ruined urban landscape. Ironically, it was the Germans, by bombing the city to rubble, that had done most to undermine their own tactics. Tanks, the German army's shock weapon, quickly got stuck in the mountains of broken bricks, while from around every corner they were pelted with Molotov cocktails. German bomb aimers were finding it more and more difficult to spot targets in the city. From the air, it was almost impossible to distinguish between Germans and Russians. Nor were the Heinkels very accurate, scattering their bombs over a path of several hundred meters. To further negate German air superiority, Chuikov ordered his men to advance as close as possible to the enemy lines. The distance between Red Army and German positions was reduced to as little as 10 meters. This made it impossible for Heinkels to bomb the enemy without also hitting their own troops. The Germans turned to their Junkers 87 dive bombers. These aircraft were far more accurate than the level bombers. In the Battle of Stalingrad, German dive bombers and their crews operated at the very limit of their endurance. One German pilot flew 228 missions in just three months at Stalingrad. The same number he'd flown in his previous three years of service. On Chuikov's orders, the powerful long-range artillery of the 62nd Army remained on the east bank of the Volga, where it was less exposed to German air raids. Artillery spotters remained in the city, often working from the top floors of buildings. When they found a good target, such as German troops massing for an assault, the spotter would use radio or telephone to direct artillery fire onto their position. The city became an ideal landscape for snipers from both sides. It became almost impossible to move around the city except on all fours. Chuvikov had ordered all commanding officers to join their men on the front line in order to boost morale. He also ordered the formation of assault teams from the infantry companies. These were much more efficient tactical units for the savage street fighting that had developed. An assault team consisted of 20 to 30 of the most experienced soldiers. Their prime weapons were submachine guns, grenades, knives and sharpened entrenching tools. Where possible, the group was supported by a light, mobile anti-tank gun, a tank, anti-tank riflemen, 
or flamethrower teams. It was up to the assault teams to take on the most hazardous of all operations, storming enemy-held buildings. A favourite tactic was to blow a hole in a side wall with the anti-tank gun. Several grenades were thrown in, the soldiers charging in in the wake of the blasts. Basements were cleared with flamethrowers and more grenades. Before entering a room, a soldier would throw a grenade in first, then come in spraying from his submachine gun. Some buildings were contested floor by floor. Soviet assault teams could be on the ground floor, with German defenders above them, and more Soviet troops fighting their way down from the upper floors. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting became common in these battles. It was an arena in which Red Army soldiers seemed to hold a psychological edge over the Germans. The Russian preference for sharp-edged entrenching tools terrified them. Individual buildings turned into fortresses, with covering fire from the surrounding buildings and streets. On the evening of the 27th of September, Sergeant Yakov Pavlov was ordered to lead a patrol to the Consumer Union building, a hundred meters in front of the Red Army lines. The building was an ideal observation point. Pavlov's men fought their way through the building. When the Germans realized their loss, they launched a furious counterattack and were met with heavy fire. The shattered wreck of the Consumer Union building soon had a new name. Official reports and orders all began to call it Pavlov's House. Underground passages were dug, connecting the house with a neighboring factory and block of flats. This allowed reinforcements to reach the house under cover. Loopholes were made to provide firing positions, and the approaches were sown with mines. In one of the flats, Russian soldiers found a gramophone that had been left behind, but only one record was still intact. They played it constantly, music floating eerily across the ruins during lulls in the fighting heard by friend and foe alike as the desperate struggle for Pavlov's house went on. Chuikov's 62nd Army headquarters had moved to an open area near some huge oil storage tanks. When German spotters found it, the shells began to fall. Both sides had assumed the storage tanks were empty. When they began to explode into enormous fireballs, it was a nasty shock for everyone. Rivers of burning oil gushed towards Chuikov's headquarters. By a miracle, they escaped, but their telephone lines were incinerated. Chuikov was cut off in this hellish trap for three days. General Yerimenka, on the east bank of the Volga, didn't know where Chuikov's headquarters were or whether the general was alive or dead. At last, a message arrived from Chuikov. It read, we are at the spot where the fire and smoke are thickest. While 62nd Army headquarters looked for a new home, the Germans were building the pressure on the city's defenders. Into the cauldron was thrown Major General Viktor Zuludoyev's airborne division. On the 14th of October, the Germans launched yet another offensive. This time the goal was the tractor factory. Zuludoyev's division was tasked to hold the position against an attack by three German infantry divisions and two panzer divisions. The division commander fought with a submachine gun in his hands, side by side with his paratroopers. A fresh division was arriving at the river crossing to reinforce them, but Zaludoev's men had to hold out until they got there. The Germans next attacked the Barricadi gun factory. Only volley firing from Katyusha's on the far bank stopped their advance. But elsewhere on the front, the Germans had already reached the Volga, splitting the 62nd Army in half. <laughs> 
Nobody, not even Chuikov, believed Stalingrad could be held for much longer. On the 16th of October, with the battle raging just 300 meters from his command post, Ludnikov's 138th Rifle Division crossed the river and went straight into action near the Barricade factory. At huge cost, the Germans were repulsed once more. From his own headquarters, Adolf Hitler raged at the failure to take Stalingrad. The BBC said that Stalingrad had swallowed up Hitler's army. Poland, it continued, was occupied in 28 days. During this same time period, the Germans only managed to occupy a few buildings in Stalingrad. France was occupied in 38 days, but in the same time period, the Germans have only managed to cross the street in Stalingrad. The Germans called the fighting in Stalingrad the Rat War. Soldiers fought at ranges of 10 or 20 meters. The soldier who was the fiercest, most cunning, courageous, determined to win at any cost, this was the soldier that would win this fight. Eleventh of November. The Germans reached the Volga near the Barricade factory, encircled Ludnikov's division and split the 62nd Army into three parts. The 138th Division, or as it became known, Ludnikov's Island, clung onto an isolated position 200 meters from the Volga. The river crossings used to ferry Soviet troops and supplies into the city were under constant fire. Now, the Volga began to freeze, and boats could no longer reach the city. The Red Army Air Force was called in. An obsolete biplane bomber, the U-2, would attempt resupply by air. Sacks of food and ammunition were strapped onto the aircraft's wing. The ropes could be quickly untied to let the cargo crash to earth. One pilot recalled, the navigator had a sort of reins. He pulled them and the load fell to earth rather randomly. However, vodka was parachuted. We used to slow down and shout, Ivan, vodka's coming. But such basic methods of resupply could never meet all the needs of the city's defenders. Winter was coming. The Germans believed that their front line, stretching from the Baltic to the Volga, was secure. Their allies, the Hungarians, Romanians and Italians, were responsible for holding the line in the Don region. The German Army High Command didn't seriously consider the possibility of a Soviet offensive in this region. The Red Army was thought to be on the brink of collapse. But as early as September, Red Army generals had been working on a plan that's goal was nothing less than the complete destruction of the German Sixth Army. Soviet forces were to attack towards the town of Kalash. Armies of the Stalingrad Front were to attack simultaneously to complete the encirclement of the Germans. The operation was codenamed Uranus. Three separate fronts were involved. The Don, the Southeastern, and Stalingrad. The operation was planned in complete secrecy. It was time to turn the tables on the German army. On the night of the 18th of November, the eve of the assault, a snowstorm dramatically reduced visibility. Stalin himself had noted, if the bombing preparation is insufficient, the operation will fail. It was completely impossible to fly in these conditions. The bombing raids were cancelled. But it was too late to postpone Uranus. In the southern zone, troops had already crossed the Volga. On the morning of the 19th of November, at 10 minutes to 9, the roar of thousands of guns was only eclipsed by the screams of Katyusha rocket fire. The shelling was done almost blindly through the snowstorm, but the Romanian troops scattered under the first blows of the Red Army. The German 48th Panzer Corps tried to launch a counterattack. They met the attacking Soviet forces head-on near the village of Ust-Medveditsky. An enormous tank battle raged for more than a day. 
At its end, the German Panzer Corps lay crushed. One of its divisions had been hindered by an unlikely foe. While the division had been in reserve with its vehicle standing idle, field mice had got inside the vehicles and gnawed through the electrical wiring. This humble ally of the Red Army had put dozens of tanks out of action. The Red Army assault south of Stalingrad began the next day. The poorly trained and ill-equipped Romanian 4th Army scattered in the face of a massed Soviet tank assault. Troops from two Soviet fronts were approaching from north and south to meet at the River Don. The severe weather slowed their advance. No local guides could be found in the villages, all of which lay abandoned. At dusk on the 22nd of November, a detachment of two motorized infantry companies, five tanks and one armored vehicle, approached the bridge near the town of Kalash. The capture of this bridge was critical to the success of the whole operation. The German guards on the bridge couldn't believe enemy tanks could be so far behind the front line. By the time they realized their mistake, it was too late. The capture of the bridge allowed the Red Army to move large numbers of troops across the Don to link up with Yerimenka's tanks coming from the south. On the fourth day of Operation Uranus, units of the Stalingrad Front met troops of the Southeastern Front near the town of Sovetsky. The trap was sprung. Paulus's Sixth Army was surrounded. But the act of encirclement alone wasn't enough to guarantee victory. There was no panic amongst the German forces that were now cut off. Hitler told Paulus, the army can rely on my taking every step to provide it with everything it needs and to end its blockade. The surrounded German troops were ordered to hold their positions and wait for rescue. But when a meeting was convened of the 6th Army Corps commanders, most wanted to attempt a breakout. It was General Erwin Janek who gave vent to what many were thinking. Reichenau wouldn't have hung about. Paulus instantly retorted, I'm not Reichenau. Paulus prevailed. Sixth Army would take up defensive positions and await a relief attempt from the outside. Field Marshal von Manstein was given the job of rescuing Sixth Army from its predicament. He quickly gathered all available forces for the offensive, which was to be led by four panzer divisions. The operation was codenamed Winter Storm. Not for nothing was Van Manstein regarded as the best operational mind in the Third Reich. He won the first round of the fight, launching his attack not in the obvious place where the German lines were closest together, but from the southwest. Von Manstein's panzers burst through the perimeter of the Soviet encirclement. The Red Army had been caught off guard. Stalin, alarmed that the prey might be about to escape the trap, immediately ordered Soviet reserves to counter this new threat. But troop movements across this frozen, devastated landscape were no simple task. One unit reported that the trains could not keep up steam. Motor transport was useless for lack of fuel. Communications with units moving on foot was difficult. For the time being, von Manstein's attack would have to be resisted by whatever troops lay in its path. These scattered and often isolated Red Army units fought desperately to keep the Germans at bay. The whole course of the Battle of Stalingrad lay in the balance. General Schulz, von Manstein's chief of staff, tried to persuade Paulus to fight his way out of Stalingrad, towards von Manstein's forces. The earlier your attack starts, the better, Schulz told him. We cannot wait. But Paulus was no longer sure his troops were capable of fighting their way out. He grew increasingly pessimistic as von Manstein's troops were first stopped and then forced into retreat. Hitler had hoped that the Luftwaffe could keep Paulus's men resupplied from the air. But it was unfeasible. Paulus and the Sixth Army were doomed. <laughs> <laughs> 
The operation to eradicate German resistance in Stalingrad was codenamed Ring. Before it began, Paulus received an ultimatum demanding his surrender. It was declined on Hitler's orders. The Red Army also appealed directly to ordinary German soldiers to surrender. Red Army Air Force pilot Lee Schenko had the unenviable job of flying his U-2 at low altitude over the front lines, while his navigator of Shisha read an ultimatum to the German soldiers through a loudspeaker. They often came under heavy fire from the ground. Lee Schenko would climb out of range and repeat the whole process somewhere else 15 minutes later. Some German soldiers believed they would get food and warmth if they surrendered. Others feared reprisals. Many were scared to disobey orders. Military discipline was maintained within Stalingrad. Deserters and thieves were still shot wherever they were caught. Operation Ring began on the 10th of January with an intense artillery bombardment. The German pocket was about 60 by 40 kilometers. Now the Germans were driven east to the Volga and into Stalingrad. Four days into the operation, the Germans were forced to abandon their main airfield at Pitomnik. This was a disaster. Fights broke out over places on the last German aircraft to leave. The wounded were forgotten. The most deserving were elbowed aside. The only supplies that reach Paulus's army now arrive by parachute. Many soldiers had fallen into complete apathy, numbed by cold and hunger, only brought to life by the sound of a transport aircraft overhead. Food had become their only concern. On the 24th of January, Paulus sent a radio message to Hitler, which ended with the words, the army requests permission to surrender immediately in order to save the lives of the remaining troops. The Führer was adamant. I forbid capitulation, he replied. The army will hold its positions until the last soldier and the last ditch. The Soviet advance had split the German pocket into two parts. The southern part was trapped in the heart of the city. The northern lay in the factory district. Paulus's headquarters was in the southern pocket. The suffering of his men finally forced him to act. He surrendered on the morning of the 31st of January with his staff. The northern group under Lieutenant General Karl Strecker fought on briefly. After a massive Soviet artillery pounding, they too laid down their arms on the 2nd of February, 1943. The final surrender at Stalingrad resulted in 91,000 German soldiers being taken prisoner. They had destroyed 6,000 guns and mortars, 1,000 German tanks, and more than 60,000 assorted vehicles. The disaster that had overtaken Paulus's army and two Romanian armies stunned Germany. It was their first major defeat at Soviet hands. On the Eastern Front, the Stavka High Command launched a full-scale offensive that routed Italian and Hungarian armies along the Don River. German forces began a headlong retreat from the Caucasus to avoid being cut off. Hitler would never reach the oil fields of Baku. All of Germany's conquests in the South that summer were reversed. The Soviet winter offensive stopped only in March 1943. Amongst the many towns and cities liberated by the Red Army was the city of Kursk. It was there that the war's next great battle would be fought.
a guardhouse in southern Russia, two men in Red Army uniforms talked casually to each other in German. A third man, wearing the uniform of a German combat engineer, listened in closely. They were men of the Brandenburg Regiment, an elite German special forces unit that often dressed in enemy uniform to carry out its missions. They had just prevented Russian engineers from destroying the dam on the river Manich. They thought the operation had been successfully completed, but suddenly a stranger appeared in the doorway. Unknown soldier blew up the Vesilovskoya Reservoir Dam on the 27th of July 1942. It caused a sudden and dramatic rise in the water level downriver and placed a major obstacle in the path of the German advance. The river Manich had been transformed from a 40 meter wide river to a huge lake four kilometers across. German tanks that would have driven straight across the dam, now had to be ferried across the lake one by one. It bought some much needed time for the retreating Red Army. But this was only a small local victory. Three days previously, German Army Group A had captured Rostov-on-Don, the gateway to the Caucasus. The main German attack came from that direction, further to the west. The only good news was that the German 4th Panzer Army would soon be redirected from the Caucasus to support the attack on Stalingrad. The same day the dam was blown, Stalin received a report from the commander of the North Caucasus Front, Marshal Semyon Mikhailovich Budyonyi. He recommended an immediate withdrawal of his forces to the line of the Terek River and the Caucasus Mountains. After the recent Soviet defeats in the Crimea, at Kharkov, and in the Donbas, the Germans possessed a significant numerical advantage over the Soviets in the Caucasus. But Yonyi believed the only way to stabilize the situation was an immediate withdrawal south. The next day, Stalin signed the famous Order Number 227, not a step back. At the same time, he approved Budyonyi's plan of retreat. It seemed a contradiction, but in the Caucasus, military logic dictated just one course of action. The Terek River and the Caucasus Mountains comprised a formidable natural defense. The troops would withdraw to this line immediately before the Germans could encircle and destroy them. All Soviet reserves were being sent to help defend Stalingrad, where one of the decisive battles of the war was unfolding. There were no troops to spare for the North Caucasus Front, and so Budyonyi's troops began to dig in along the Terek. The great German summer offensive of 1942 was underway. Army Group B was advancing on Stalingrad, from where it could protect the northern flank of Army Group A, bound for the Soviet oil fields of the Caucasus. Before the war, 70% of all Soviet oil came from the Baku oil fields of the Caucasus. About a quarter came from the area around Grozny and Makop. Their capture would be a disaster and leave the Red Army without fuel. Hitler believed the war would be decided by the control of oil supplies. He was obsessed by oil and had even studied how it was drilled and refined. As Case Blue began, Army Group A breached Soviet defenses and began a rapid advance towards these vital oil fields. <laughs> 
von Kleist's first Panzer Army led the way. In 1941, von Kleist had commanded the first Panzer Group in Ukraine. In the first week of the war, he had won a giant four-day tank battle at Brody. Now, he had been entrusted with the capture of the Caucasus oil fields. Marshal Budyonyi, by contrast, had experienced only defeat. Now, he oversaw his forces' retreat to the mountains. The Caucasus Mountains stretch 1,300 kilometers from the Caspian to the Black Sea. The range is divided into three parts. The Eastern Caucasus runs from the Abshiron Peninsula to Mount Kazbek, the Central Caucasus from Kazbek to Mount Elbrus, and the Western Caucasus from Elbrus to Anapa. Snow and ice cover the highest peaks all year round, and to reach Grozny, one must also cross the fast-flowing Terek River. Von Kleist planned to advance straight to Odzonokidze and follow the old Georgian military road straight to Tbilisi. He would ignore the mountain passes of the Western Caucasus in order to concentrate his forces. But Hitler rejected this plan, and the 49th Mountain Corps was diverted to the Western Caucasus. Hitler was adding another objective to Army Group A's ambitious list of goals. He now also demanded the capture of Soviet naval bases on the Black Sea coast. But Yonyi had very few tanks at his disposal. But because of his static positions, he did have the advantage in heavy artillery. He was also supported by powerful air units. The summer of 1942 saw an important change in the organization of the Red Army Air Force. Air armies were now assigned to Red Army fronts. It was a similar system to the one used by the Luftwaffe. It meant Air Force command was now more centralized, allowing concerted action. Previously, Soviet air units had been parceled out into small, ineffective formations. Soviet air strength in the Caucasus comprised the naval aviation of the Black Sea Fleet, the 5th Air Army under Lieutenant General Guryenov, and the 4th Air Army under Major General Vershinin. Konstantin Andreevich Vershinin began his military career in the infantry during the Russian Civil War. He only learned to fly in his 30s after he was transferred to the Air Force Academy. Initially, he wasn't enthusiastic about the Air Force, but his infantry background helped him to appreciate how air power could be used to support ground troops. In August 1942, the survival of Budyonyi's front depended on Vashinin's pilots. They constantly harried the advancing German columns with bombs and rockets. Air Force was also the eyes of the retreating Red Army. Reconnaissance aircraft tracked the southern progress of von Kleist's Panzer Army. Following in the footsteps of the retreating Soviet troops came soldiers of the German 1st and 4th Mountain Divisions. Wir müssen diesen Berg besteigen. Der Abendwind sind wir da. Geht alle hinter andere. Folgt mir. Gehen wir. These men were mountain warfare specialists from the Austrian Tyrol and the Bavarian Alps. They traveled with climbing gear, pack animals, and specialized equipment, including lightweight artillery that could be disassembled and carried in sections on the backs of mules. The mountain infantry were ordered to fight their way through the mountain passes west of Elbrus and advance on Tbilisi. They only had a few weeks to get through the mountains before winter weather made them impassable. If they did break through, here and to the west, 
They could also capture the last Soviet naval bases on the Black Sea. The local Soviet commanders believed the mountains posed such a formidable obstacle that the passes only needed to be held by small detachments. But they had not counted on the expertise of the German mountain divisions. The German mountain troops began their advance through the Western Caucasus Mountains on the 15th of August. They planned a bold flanking movement of the Klukov Pass. Two squads armed with machine guns and mortars climbed for hours. The Soviet defenders suddenly found the enemy was behind them. Poor communications added to the crisis. Soviet headquarters only found out about the battle two days after it happened. Reserves were immediately sent in, including NKVD troops and cadets from the Sukumi Military Academy. The Stavka High Command radioed an urgent warning. The enemy has specially trained mountain troops and will use every road and path in the Caucasus Mountains to reach the South Caucasus. Commanders who believe the mountains to be an impassable obstacle are gravely mistaken. Only a skillfully prepared and well-defended line is impassable. But the warning had come too late for the defenders of the Klukov Pass. Soviet reserves reached the Klukov Pass a week after the initial attack. By then, the Germans were already on the southern slopes. Though they were prevented from advancing any further, they could not be dislodged. The Germans, meanwhile, had sent a detachment to Mount Elbrus, the highest peak in the Caucasus. On the 18th of August, they reached the refuge of 11 tourist camp. At 4,130 metres above sea level, the Refuge of Eleven has been described as the highest hotel in the world. The first wooden shelter was erected in 1932. Six years later, a three-storey shelter, coated in metal and resembling an airship, was built in its place. From this shelter, the Germans set off for the summit. On the 21st of August, soldiers of the German 1st Mountain Division raised the swastika flag over Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. It was a propaganda triumph, though Hitler himself was said to have been furious at what he regarded as a mere stunt. Meanwhile, in Moscow, events in the Caucasus were causing serious alarm. The feared head of the NKVD secret police, Lavrenti Beria, flew personally to Sukumi, his hometown, and sacked the commander of the 46th Army, General Sagatskov. In the eastern Caucasus, von Kleist's 1st Panzer Army had secured a toehold across the Terek River. But they encountered fierce resistance from Soviet units, which contained many local men who knew the mountains like the palm of their hand. Artillery observers on the high ground were able to direct accurate fire from Katyusha's and Howitzer's onto German pontoons across the Terek. The Germans were also confronted with a novel form of anti-tank barrier. Soviet soldiers filled ditches with oil, then set fire to them with flamethrowers. It created an impenetrable wall of fire and thick, noxious black smoke. <laughs> 
Villages in the area of Malgebeck changed hands several times. It was not until the Germans secretly moved the 13th Panzer Division south across the Terek that they were able to secure the area. They were reinforced by the SS Motorized Division, Viking. On the 27th of September, the Germans captured El Kertovo, but were forced back onto the defensive the very next day. Meanwhile, Luftwaffe units in the Caucasus had been sent north to Stalingrad, giving the Soviet Air Force a free hand. Vashinin's aircraft targeted the German pontoon bridges across the Terek. Vashinin always emphasized to his men the importance of supporting the ground forces. We exist for them, he told his pilots, not the other way around. It was difficult to get tanks from factories in Russia to the troops in the Caucasus. But one of the Allied Lend-Lease supply routes came up through the Caucasus from Iran. As a result, many Soviet tanks on this front were British and American models. By October 1942, the Caucasus front had a total of 300 tanks. British and American types made up 42%. T-34 medium tanks made up 20%, and heavy KV tanks just 2%. The remaining 36% were various types of Soviet light tank. The American M3 Stuart and the British Valentine were inferior to the T-34 and most German tanks. But they were an improvement on the Soviet light tanks, such as the T-26 and the BT-7, which were poorly armoured and seriously undergunned. Vashinin's 4th Air Army also received Lend-Lease equipment. Its pilots were among the first to master the American twin-engine Boston bomber. They particularly liked its navigational instruments, which made it safer than most aircraft to fly through the mountains in unpredictable weather. Another aircraft that thrived in the mountains was the I-153 Seagull biplane. Low speeds and superb maneuverability made it an effective fighter bomber amid the ravines and passes. Rocket attacks by low-flying seagulls were a common sight in these high-altitude battles. On the ground, special NKVD units with Alpine training had been formed. They carried the fight back to the Germans with their own deep, outflanking maneuvers. Their gear was a strange mix of pre-war sportswear, military uniform and captured German kit. Painstaking reconnaissance was the bedrock of these units' operations. In early September, one of these units was able to turn the tables on the Germans in the Klukov Pass, the scene of their earlier defeat. Soviet mountain troops spotted a long caravan of German soldiers and pack animals heading up to the pass. They were a long way off, beyond rifle range. Just then, three aircraft marked with the Red Star zoomed overhead. Gusev, a section commander of engineers, described what happened. Our pilots weren't only skilled, they also knew the mountains. First, they attacked the convoy itself, but the results weren't great. So then they bombed the slopes above the road. Huge, great stone blocks fell down towards Hitler's convoy. The slope disappeared in a thick cloud of dust. And when it cleared, 
we saw the convoy had been devastated. By September 1942, a stalemate had been reached in the mountain passes of the Caucasus. German mountain infantry couldn't build on their initial success and break through to the coast. But nor were Soviet forces strong enough to recapture the high passes they lost in August. On the 28th of September, one of the most unusual battles of the Second World War took place at more than 4,000 metres above sea level. The Soviets had formed a special NKVD detachment, about 100 strong, to recapture the refuge of the Eleven near the summit of Mount Elbrus. They were led by Lieutenant Gregorians and armed with machine guns, mortars and sniper rifles. The German mountain troops were stunned by the audacity of the attack, but they quickly rallied. Machine gun fire echoed across the mountains for several hours. Slowly, the tide of battle turned against Lieutenant Gregorians and his men. Only four men from his detachment made it back alive. The lieutenant's body was one of many that littered the mountain slope. A few days later, the temperature in the mountains plummeted. Soon, both sides were losing more men to frostbite and avalanches than they did from combat. It was impossible to fight in such conditions there would be no German breakthrough in the mountains in 1942. In the Caucasus, the Germans found some support from nationalists and anti-communists amongst the local population. The strong history of nationalism in the Caucasus made it fertile recruiting ground for the Wehrmacht. They had captured many conscripts from Georgia, Chechnya, Armenia and Azerbaijan, some of whom were prepared to fight against the Soviet Union. They were formed into the so-called Eastern Legions. But many of these units turned out to be deeply unreliable. In October, the 23rd Panzer Division was informed that a battalion of Georgian volunteers planned to go over to the Soviet side. The Germans immediately made arrangements to disarm the unit and take it off the front line. After a shootout with the Germans, some of the Georgians did manage to slip over to the Soviet lines. The episode was symptomatic of the variable military worth of the Eastern Legions. The German bridgehead across the Terek River was of continuing concern to the Soviet Front Command. In November, it was decided to eliminate this foothold with an overwhelming infantry and tank assault. But before it could begin, 
Von Kleist, using the last of his fuel and ammunition reserves, launched his own assault. He had decided to try and fight his way through to Ordzunikidze along a new route, which lay through the towns of Baksan and Nalchik. Tanks of the 1st Panzer Army, supported by airstrikes, made a rapid advance. The Germans, it seemed, had rediscovered the Blitzkrieg spirit. Soon they had reached the outskirts of Ordzonikidze, but their success was short-lived. Forces from the South Caucasus Front were sent to crush the Terek bridgehead. Two German panzer divisions were surrounded near the village of Gizel. The Germans were forced to abandon their vehicles and heavy weapons and fight their way out on foot. For the Germans, reaching Tbilisi was now out of the question. In 2007, President Putin would award both Malgobek and Ordzunikidze, today known as Vladikavkaz, the title of City of Military Glory for their wartime heroism. In November, the encirclement of 6th Army at Stalingrad turned the campaign on its head. If the Germans did not immediately evacuate the Caucasus, the Red Army might reach Rostov and cut off the entire Army Group A. On the 22nd of November, von Kleist was promoted to command of Army Group A. He immediately ordered the 1st Panzer Army to withdraw to Rostov, while 17th Army retreated to the Kuban bridgehead. The only way to keep the Kuban bridgehead supplied was by air. It would have been impossible if 6th Army had still been holding out at Stalingrad. But their surrender freed up enough Luftwaffe transport aircraft to establish an air bridge to Kuban. On the 13th of March, Army Group A received new orders from the Army High Command. Hold the Kuban bridgehead and the Crimea at all costs. Von Kleist made his own report to the Army High Command about the value of the Kuban bridgehead. Advantages of the position. A considerable number of Russian forces are tied up. The enemy Black Sea Fleet is unable to conduct offensive operations. The defense of the Crimea is facilitated. In the spring of 1943, most of the Eastern Front was quiet as both sides geared up for the Battle of Kursk. But at Kuban, the fighting rumbled on. The Shinin ordered the construction of an Air Force command post near the front line. The battlefield was small here. Air raids and fighter patrols could be observed from the ground and information relayed back to the squadrons. Dogfights above the Kuban bridgehead frequently involved 30 to 40 aircraft on each side. Vashinin had demanded that his fighters keep enemy bombers away from their infantry lines at all costs. The air battle over Kuban became one of the most famous of the Eastern Front. Under unrelenting pressure from the Red Army, the Kuban bridgehead finally began to buckle in August 1943. The Germans were outflanked by Soviet advances to the north and by amphibious landings at Novorossiysk. <laughs> 
In October, the 17th Army was evacuated to the Crimea. Hitler's quest for oil had proved to be a disaster. A Soviet artillery officer studied enemy positions on the Perikop Isthmus, the gateway to the Crimea. He was looking for targets for the 280 millimeter mortars. Their 200 kilogram shells could smash through the thickest of walls. Preparations for the Crimea offensive were underway. The Red Army's advance through Ukraine had isolated German and Romanian forces in the peninsula. But only three narrow strips of land connect the Crimea to the mainland. At Perikop, the isthmus is just 14 kilometers wide. There would be no room to maneuver. German and Romanian troops of the 17th Army had had five months to fortify the Perikop Isthmus. Machine gun crews stood ready to mow down advancing Soviet infantry. Howitzers were hidden in the valleys. Romanian dictator Marshal Antonescu wanted Hitler to evacuate the Crimea, where seven Romanian divisions were stationed. But the Fuhrer feared the Soviets would use Crimean airfields to bomb the Romanian oil fields. Germany's chrome supplies from Turkey would also be threatened. Admiral Dönitz assured Hitler that if required, the Navy could evacuate 17th Army by sea. But he was counting on the Germans holding on to the port of Odessa. And on the 10th of April 1944, Odessa fell to the Red Army. Ten days earlier, Hitler had fired von Kleist from command of Army Group A. His replacement was Colonel General Ferdinand Schoener. After arriving in the Crimea, Schoener reported back to Hitler, telling him the situation was stable and the Crimea could hold out for many months. On the 8th of April 1944, at Perikop, Sivash and Kerch, the Soviet guns roared into life. Timber gun emplacements were turned into matchwood. Buildings were reduced to rubble. Finally, uniformed men sprang up from the Red Army trenches. Shouts of Ura, the Russian battle cry, could be heard, and the squeal of tank tracks. The Germans raced from their dugouts to their fighting positions. Concealed guns opened fire. It was an old trick. A Soviet forward artillery observer was meticulously noting the muzzle flashes and sending their coordinates back to the batteries by telephone. <laughs> Soviet artillery pummeled the German positions that had just given themselves away. The dummies were cut to ribbons, but they had served their purpose. Now, the soldiers took them down and prepared for the real attack. They were supported by T-34s of the Second Guards Army. Amongst them, the feared OT-34 flamethrower tanks. <laughs> 
the Red Army onslaught proved irresistible. The assault was supported by amphibious landings that outflanked the German defences at Perikop. The commander of the 17th Army, General Janneke, received permission to retreat. The Germans began a swift withdrawal towards Sevastopol, where Hitler expected them to hold out for many months, as the Soviets had in 1942. The evacuation of German and Romanian troops from Sevastopol began. The transports would be highly exposed. But after losing a battleship and two destroyers to air attack the previous year, the Stavka ordered the big ships of the Black Sea Fleet to stay out of range of the Luftwaffe. Soviet submarines had also suffered heavy losses it would primarily fall to the Air Force to prevent the evacuation. By 1944, Navy pilots of the Black Sea Fleet had mastered a lethal new form of attack. It was known as skip bombing. Skip bombing attacks had to be made at high speed and low altitude. When the bomb was released, it would skip like a pebble across the surface of a lake and strike the side of the ship. Meanwhile, the pilot climbed hard to avoid the ship's superstructure. Skip bombing had several advantages over aerial torpedo attacks. Firstly, it was effective against ships with very shallow drafts, like landing craft. Secondly, a ship could spot a torpedo and dodge it with evasive action. But the bomb was on them in just seconds. Thirdly, torpedoes were expensive and in high demand. By comparison, bombs were plentiful and cheap. Boston bombers proved the most effective skip bombers, but the new tactic was also successfully employed by Lavoshkin 5 fighters, Ilyushin 2s and Ilyushin 4s. Units of the 4th Ukrainian Front pursued the enemy to the gates of Sevastopol. The heavy artillery was brought up in preparation for a long siege. On the 5th of May 1944, after a 90-minute barrage, the Soviet infantry began their assault. In 1941, the Red Army had held Sevastopol for nine months against the Germans. But this time, it would not be such a drawn-out affair. Sevastopol's northern shore fell to the Red Army within three days, putting the harbour in range of Soviet artillery. German ships arriving from the Romanian port of Constanta had to run a gauntlet of air attacks and shelling at the landing stages. Admiral Otjebriski, commander of the Black Sea Fleet, requested permission to send his cruisers to attack the German and Romanian transports. But the Stavka refused. The big warships were not to be exposed to air attack. This was a job for the submarines and the Air Force. In the small hours of the 10th of May, the German transport ships Tortilla and Teja arrived off Sevastopol. It was too dangerous for them to approach the harbour, so the ships anchored two miles offshore, while 10,000 soldiers were ferried out to them in assault boats from the southwestern docks of Kiersonis. As the embarkation was underway, more than 20 Ilyushin II Sturmoviks appeared overhead. The Tortilla was hit by three bombs and sank in minutes. The second transport, Teja, weighed anchor and headed for the open sea, but the Soviet Air Force soon caught up with her. 
The Taya was hit by no fewer than six 100 kilogram bombs. She lost steering and engine power before 11 Boston bombers arrived to finish her off. Two bombs hit the Taya near the waterline. These were the fatal blows. The loss of both transports cost up to 8,000 lives. These were by far the greatest losses of the evacuation. In all, about two-thirds of 17th Army was evacuated, including its commander, General Almendinger, who reached Constanta by torpedo boat on the night of the 11th. General Hartmann was left in charge at Sevastopol, but without heavy weapons, there was no chance of holding off the Red Army for more than a few hours. The remnants of 17th Army were overrun the next day, the 12th of May, 1944. British war correspondent Alexander Worth visited Sebastopol when the fighting was over. Around Kasonis it was gruesome. All the area in front of the earthworks and beyond was ploughed up by thousands of shells and scorched by the fire of Katyushas. The ground was littered with thousands of German helmets, rifles, bayonets and other arms and ammunition. Nearly all the dead had been buried, but around the shattered lighthouse, dead Germans and rafts were bobbing in the water. The German 17th Army had been effectively destroyed in the Crimea. In the month-long campaign, it had suffered nearly 70,000 men killed or captured. Soviet dead and captured totaled approximately 18,000. The Wehrmacht was suffering a series of devastating defeats on the Eastern Front. After his dismissal by Hitler, Field Marshal von Kleist went into enforced retirement. At the end of the war, he was arrested by the Americans and later extradited to Yugoslavia. There, he was sentenced to 15 years for war crimes. But he was also wanted in the Soviet Union. In 1948, Marshal Tito agreed to extradite von Kleist to the USSR. In 1952, the military collegium of the Supreme Court of the USSR sentenced him to 25 years. Von Kleist died in a Soviet prisoner of war camp from ill health two years later. After the liberation of the Crimea, the 4th Air Army was sent to Belorussia. There, its squadrons would support Operation Bagration as the war in the East turned decisively against Nazi Germany. They would pursue the Wehrmacht across the battlefields of East Prussia and Pomerania and on to the very streets of Berlin. <laughs> 